wants us to do. Okay, if you missed the last couple of messages, you can find those messages online at our website at shorelinefullgospel.org. Or you can listen to those messages as our good friend Christopher Bobo has uploaded like 250, 60 messages to YouTube. Uh, you just look on YouTube at Shoreline Full Gospel uh, Fellowship, Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship, and you will find all those messages. So now, as we were, have been talking about the last couple of weeks, now is a word that really describes who God is in the sense that he's always in the present. He is always in the present. He is always in the present. Okay? Uh, God is never a God of was. It's a God of is. He says, I am, not I was, not I'm going to be, because, see, God never changes, and God stands outside of time, and God is in the ever right now. And you know what? We're children of God, and we have his spiritual DNA in us, and we need to become the children of the right now, the children that isn't like someday, someday, someday. You know, like some people think of salvation that way. They think, well, I get saved, and I'm waiting for the day I actually get saved. You know, that's when I go to heaven. No, you're saved right now. Okay? You'd be, I'm waiting for that day that I die and then I get eternal life. You have eternal life right now. Right now. We have to realize our God is a God of the present. Okay? What he sees in the future, to him, he sees it as it's right now. Okay? That's how he could look before the foundation of the world and look at the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, even before it ever happened. And to him, it's right now because he's in the presence. Okay? Now, what a lot of us have put things off till tomorrow. We have no now switch. We just have a tomorrow switch. And everything, we just flipped it on. And, yeah, someday. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to get around to that. You know, when you get around to it, it might be too late. We are not promised tomorrow. We only promise the present. We are here right now, and this is the day. So 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says this. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. This is God speaking. I tell you, now is the time of favor. Now is the day of salvation. Now, if you remember last week, I said, when? Well, that was really lame. When? There you go. Every instruction, every command, every admonition communicated in God's word has an implied now with it. All right? So imagine this is, uh, well, back in the back there is Kara Brown and her her husband is an officer of the law, okay? So his name's Mark. So can you imagine Mark? He sees some guy coming out of a bank, and he's got a bag in his hands, and he's starting to run, and he's got a gun in one hand. And Mark says, stop! And the guy goes, will tomorrow do? Maybe in a few minutes. No, I mean, when I say stop, I mean now. You see, Im implied in that word is now. Now, we understand that if a cop tells you to stop, you better stop, otherwise you might end up you know, on the slab, right? Okay. He means now, when you are in the army and the general says to his troops, he says, open fire. He doesn't mean open fire when you feel like it, when you get around to it. Take a break for a while first. He means now, right? Now, now, now. You see, you don't even have to say now to those things. We understand. Those mean now. When he says open fire, he means now. When he says stop, well, he means now. You know, when God tells us to forgive, he means now. I'm going to work my way up to that. No, you're not going to work your way up to it. You've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to break that stronghold off your life right now. And he says, do it now. He would not tell you to do what you could not do, but he gave you the Holy Spirit so you could do it, and you could do it when? Very good, very good. Now. That word, today is the day of salvation. There's another scripture, Hebrews 3.15, that says, As it has been said, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. The word today found in the scriptures in the New Testament is a word that means now. That's what it means. It doesn't mean today like, uh, you know, like uh, whatever this is, January 22nd. It means right now. It means immediately, okay? So when God says to his children, repent, he means now. You know, there's some people, you, 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 you go up to some people, you tell them about Jesus, you tell them about their need for the Savior and their need for salvation, and they go, well, you know, i got to get a few things straightened out first. No, 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 no. You don't get anything straightened out until you come to the one who straightened you out. You need to come to Jesus today. You need to turn your heart to him today. When he says repent, you need to repent now. 
When he says pray for those that persecute you, it's not like I'm getting around and I'm warming up to that idea. He goes, I mean, now, right now. Oh, but I can't. But yes, you can. By the Holy Spirit, you can do all the things that God has ever asked you to do. When he says pray without ceasing, you go, you know, I've got this plan. It's the, the five-year plan. In five years, I plan to be praying without ceasing. He's, no, 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 no. When I said pray without ceasing, I didn't say someday. Because someday may not come. Tomorrow is not promised. But right now, you have the opportunity to respond to God with a yes or a no. And when you say no, or when you say wait, you're just simply saying, God, I don't want to do it your way. God, I'm resisting your spirit. God, I don't feel like it right now. You know, God doesn't ask us if we feel like stuff. And the, you know what? If you've ever had, I know people that have had a, ch a child that was into addiction, and, and, and the parent is just, it's such grief they're going through. They're watching this child that they love so much, and they want to intervene somehow and get them to stop right now. And the child's like, you know, sometimes, oh, I've got it under control. Give me time. I'm, I've got this licked. I can handle this. And they like, they feel desperate. I have to do something now because you, you are not stopping. You are not hearing. You are putting off. And if you put off too long, you could be dead. And I don't want you to be dead. I want you to be alive. Sometimes an intervention has to occur. You know what? God has already intervened. He brought Jesus Christ to us. He said, right now, I'm breaking it off of you. Right now, you can be saved. Right now, you can be set free. Right now, you can be delivered. Turn to him right now. He's calling for us now. He wants us to hear the now in everything he says to us, in every admonition, in every encouragement, in every instruction, in every correction. There's an implied now. Just like when the cop says stop, there's an implied now. Right? Okay? Now, um, we can all agree that physical exercise is uncomfortable for the body. Right? But it's good for the body, isn't it? Do you realize spiritual exercise is uncomfortable for the flesh, but it's good for the spirit? And God wants us to be built up spiritually. God wants us to rise up and be all that we have been called to be. He wants us to put aside carnal indulgences that say, I'm just going to sit on the couch and eat bonbons, and spiritually work out, spiritually get to it, okay? Now, I'm telling you something, and you may have a conflict within yourself right now. And that's normal. I want you to know it's normal. You know, you don't have to hide it. You don't have to think, well, I, if only he knew how much I'm rebelling right now. If he only knew how much I don't want to do it right now. If he only knew how much this rubs me the wrong way right now. It's normal for you to have that because you have flesh, okay? And you have a spirit. The thing that isn't normal, okay, is this, is for us to not go with the flesh but to go with the spirit. But God's given us his spirit so that we can choose to go with the spirit. And the spirit and the flesh war against each other. So the fact you're having a war in you is normal, but you have to decide who's in control. You have to decide what you're going to yield to, to the flesh or to the will of God. And the will of God says right now. The will of God doesn't say when the flesh feels like it, because the flesh is never going to feel like spiritual things. All right? Now, when you signed up for Christ, you know what you signed up for? You signed up for somebody who has a twofold ministry in your life. He's your Lord and Savior. A lot of us go, oh, oh, well, I only checked the Savior box. I didn't check the Lord part. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't come in that version. He's the Lord and Savior. When Jesus saves us, he doesn't only save us, he becomes the Lord of our lives, okay? And when he's the Lord of your lives, that means that he's the one who calls the shots. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so this isn't the kind of sugar-coated, Fruit Loop kind of cereal you might want today. This might be the high fiber that you need, all right? But we need it. We all know that Jesus is our Savior. Now, you know, this word Savior, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, it says, uh, it's, it's the Greek word that's kyrios, which means this. It means a person exercising absolute ownership rights, Lord Likewise denotes an owner, a master, exercising full rights. Do you know Jesus Christ is either your Savior and Lord, or he's not your Savior? Ooh, ooh, that hurts. But I'm a Jesus fan, not a follower. There's no such thing, okay? Uh, but I'm a, you know, I'm a Jesus enthusiast. It's a hobby. 
No such thing. You're in or you're out. And you need to be, what? All in, right? All in. You need to be all in because either you're in Christ or you're out of Christ. Okay? So we need to be all in. And we need to have him be our Lord and our Savior. And if he's the Lord, that means that we don't call the shots he does. Right? He's our Savior. People don't like this uh, kind of preaching anymore. Why? It's very simple why. Their flesh doesn't want it. All right? But I'm going to tell you the truth because if I love you, I'll tell you the truth. If I don't love you, I'll just let everybody go to hell. But if I love you, I'll tell you the truth. The Bible says this, that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to go to heaven? A lot? Do you want your neighbor to go to heaven? I guess that means you've got to do something, doesn't it? If you love your neighbor as yourself and you want to make sure you got saved, how about getting, make sure they get saved? Oh, that's not comfortable. I know it's not comfortable because the flesh doesn't find it comfortable. And here's the thing, is we know as we watch the time clock ticking away and we see prophecies fulfilled, we know that we're in the last days. We don't have another last days. This is, these are them. These are them. These are those. We're in the last days. That means the last days, uh, all the stuff prophetically that was supposed to happen in the last days must be happening right now. So, you know what? Uh, you could get a big church a bigger church and a bigger and bigger, bigger church and the biggest church in the whole world if you preach stuff that people want to hear. Now, when you speak the truth, you have to speak it in love. So I'm not speaking it in anger. I'm not speaking it out of, out of you know, spite. I'm speaking it in love, but it's still truth. And does truth always comfort you? Well, in the end, it will. But at first, it may not. Just like, you know what, you may have to have, uh, you know, Taking a splinter out of your hand is not going to be comfortable. It may hurt. But when it's out, it's going to feel a whole lot better, right? So here's the thing. In the last days, what's going to happen is people are going to be looking for churches that preach exactly what they want to hear, but not what the Bible says, right? Your Second Timothy 4, 2 through 4. This is what the Bible tells us to do. It says, preach the Word of God. I guess we got to preach what comes in, out of the Bible. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Ooh, this is inconvenient to preach this right now. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage people with good teaching. The only good teaching is the kind that comes from the Bible. For a time is coming in the latter times. This is it. When people will no longer listen to sound or wholesome doctrine. They will follow their own desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. That's today. You know what? Uh, if you love yourself enough to want to be free, then you've got to be able to take the truth. And the truth is not always convenient. And the truth doesn't always feel good when it's applied initially. But it always is good later because it sets you free, because it makes you whole, because it brings you closer to the Lord. You want to hear something just a certain way. You want to hear a message dumbed down or sanitized in such a way that it won't make you uncomfortable. You know what? If the truth makes you totally comfortable, that means you're really, really sanctified because the truth will often make you uncomfortable because it challenges us. It challenges us to say, I need to step it up. I am not comfortable sitting on the couch eating spiritual bonbons. I need to work out. I need to be all that I can be for Jesus. Okay? God is truth. When we reject truth, we reject the very person of who God is. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12 says this. He, and that's Satan, will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe lies. Then they will be co condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. God wants to give you the truth, but if you will plug your ears to the truth, he'll let you have your lie. But the end of that is destruction. I don't want the lie. If you don't want the lie, you have to open your ear to the truth. When God speaks the truth, you have to say, oh, that might hurt, but I'm listening. The lie sometimes tastes better to the flesh than the truth. 
but the lie is a poison and it brings death. The truth sometimes is uncomfortable, but in the end it brings life. You have to love the truth. When we hear the truth, there is a time to respond to the truth. When? There it is. That's the time. Whatever it is, if you don't read your Bible with the thought of this, yes, I have met people like this, I don't want to read the Bible because what I don't know, I'm not accountable for. Wrong. Wrong. I'm going to fix that for you right now. You're accountable now because the Bible says, here's the scripture even if you never read it, so I'm going to read it for you right here. Study, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There, I just told you, study to show yourself approved. That means you've got to study. Guess what? You've got to read the word. Oh, but I didn't know that. You know it now. The truth is in the word. The truth will make you free. You have to receive the truth before you will receive freedom. When we hear the word of God, when we hear the admonition of God, when we hear the voice of God, we have to respond now, as we hear it, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. When were we really planning on getting serious about our prayer life anyway? See, we look at prayer life like that's that drudgery of exercise. Oh, my God, prayer life. Oh, you know, oh, my gosh, another half an hour of prayer. Oh, man, I just don't feel, I'm going to lay on the couch and watch TV, right? Well, here's the thing. When were you planning on getting serious? I have this four-year plan, five-year plan. I'm going to be so much in spiritual shape in a couple of years. You just watch. You don't have a couple of years, perhaps. We don't know. You have today, okay? When are we going to be about doing what God's already told us to do? When are we going to be about our ministry that God's given us individually? When are we going to be about the outreach to the loss that God has talked to us about? When are we going to be about serving others? Now, Julie's got this thing going. It's serving others. When are we going to be about giving and sacrificing and speaking out the truth and telling others about Jesus and compelling them to come together with us so that we can together grow together and support each other together and fellowship together? When are we going to talk to people about making a decision for Christ today? Now, oh, there you go. Now, very good. When were we planning on setting our hearts on things above, on seeking out God's will in all matters? On becoming thankful in all circumstances. On cleaning up our speech. Oh, that'll wait. No, it won't. Right now. On mentoring others and pouring ourselves into the lives of those who have not come as far as we have. Oh, there's a lot of mentors who are wasting what they have because they need to give it to those that don't have it yet. You can give them a shortcut in their growth. When are we going to be serious about being faithful, not flaky? When is our word going to actually be our bond? When, when are we going to be here for each other no matter what, right? When are we going to show up and become a people of God's word and live it out in such a way that people see it in our lives and they note they've been with Jesus? What day were we planning on doing all that? How about now? How about now? Ephesians five fourteen through 17 says this. Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. It says this, listen. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. When do you want to take that scripture to heart? When? Yeah. Very good, very good, very good. Do you hear the voice of God calling within you? Do you hear two voices calling within you? One is saying, yes, Lord, I hear you. I want to please you in every, every area of my life. And the other is, oh, no, a challenge to change, to come out of my comfort zone. I don't really want to hear this right now. Actually, I don't want to hear it ever. God says today is the day. Now is the time. It's time to put your hand to the plow and not look back. Some will say, I'm waiting on God's voice. You know what? There's a lot of people waiting on God's voice who haven't done what he's already spoken. And I'm going to tell you what. When you turn a deaf ear to those things you already know, you're not going to hear anything later on either because you've, your ears have been stopped. Well, I'm waiting on God to tell me something. You know what? God told you today to forgive. I'm waiting on him to tell me my big minute. He told you today to pray without ceasing. He told you today to bless those that curse you. He told you that already. Are you doing that? Don't expect further instructions until you've done the previous instructions. Right? 
If you did hear God's voice today, as you're praying, say, this is what I want you to do. Do you know with all your heart that you would respond and do it right now? Or would you go, oh, now that I've got that, I've got to work on that. I've got to think about that. I've got to meditate on that. I've got to get myself lined up with that. You know what? When God says do it, he means now. When God says go, he means now. God gave us direction already, and we're waiting sometimes for other direction. Lord, I'm waiting for a better direction than that one, because that one's not my favorite direction. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 23 says this, always be joyful. I'm going to do that one of these days. You know, God didn't tell you to wait for this. He's like, giving you the Holy Spirit, so all this stuff I'm asking you, I'm not really asking you, I'm telling you to do it. All this stuff I'm telling you, by the Holy Spirit, you can do it right now. You can always be joyful. Never stop praying. Oh, well, Lord, you know, I got work to do. Well, you know what? Here's the thing. That's a, that's a good excuse. I got work to do, so I'm on the phone doing this business. I can't be praying while I'm doing it. That. That, that's fine. That's fine. We can talk about how that actually works. But let me ask you this. When you're not on the phone and doing business, are you praying? When you do have the time, are you praying? Not usually. We have to walk in an attitude where we're constantly in communion with God. Praying is being in communion with God. We're talking to Him. We're talking to Him. We're listening to Him. Yes, we got to do our job and do our stuff, but we're constantly in contact. We never hang up, okay? We're constantly talking to Him. It says, pray without ceasing. It says, be thankful in all circumstances for this. You say, I'm waiting for God's will. For this is the will of God for those of you who belong to Christ Jesus. When's it His will? Now. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. How are you going to stifle the Holy Spirit? By saying, not now. Okay? Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. When should you stay away from every kind of evil? Now. So if there's evil in your life that you're not staying away from, if there's evil, you say, I'm trying to stop it. I'm trying to get over it. I'm trying to break it. God says, now is the time to get away from it. Flee from it right now. Okay? It says every kind of evil. Then it says in the 23rd verse, starts with the word now. Now, may the God of peace make you holy in every way. Who's he talking to? He's talking to all those people that just took those previous instructions. Those ones say, okay, I'm going to pray without ceasing. I'm going to give thanks in all circumstances, right? I'm going to do all those things. It says, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the day of Jesus Christ. Every future goal you have for becoming more and more Christ-like has to be taken out of the future and put into the right now, right now, okay? Matthew 10, 7, and 8, Jesus gave some direction to disciples, and he said, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. They go, Lord, when would you like us to do that? They understood. The direction was go. And the direction go means go now. We need to begin to use what we have. When you begin to use what you have, you develop what you have, and you become better and better and better at doing it. And then it becomes something that actually flows out of you after a period of time. But if you never start, you never get good at it. And if you put it to her someday, 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 you don't know that someday will ever come. I don't have a contract, and you don't from God either, that says, here's the time I've allowed in your life. you got this much time, and then I'm taking you home that day. We don't even know what that day is, do we? That's why we've got to do it now. Well, today, while it is day. All the gifts you have are to be used today. Right now, you need to start using your gifts. I'm not very good at that gift. Start exercising and get good at it, okay? Um, start doing it today. Uh, all the gifts you have are to build up the church. Do you know when you don't use your gifts, the rest of us suffer? All the gifts you have are not for yourself. They're actually for others. You know that? We are suffering because there's some of you out there who have gifts of the Holy Spirit that aren't using them. Because, well, I'm not sure I'm good at that yet. I'm not sure I'm good at that. We need to start giving the gifts we've been given now. And God gives us so that we have to give to others. God gives seed to the sower, the Bible says. The sower is not the hoarder. The sower is the one who gives it out. Let's start today, right now, to use every gift we have, to use every talent we have, every platform to speak that we have, every relationship we have, every opportunity we have, every resource we have, everything we have for the building up of God's kingdom. Now, today. Last week, I encouraged you to start doing something. 
Because it'll change the meaning of all the Scriptures in the New Testament when you add the word now to them. When it tells you, here's what you should be doing, here's how you should be thinking, here's how you should be walking, when you put the word now, suddenly you have something to do. Suddenly it's not like, well, I wish the Bible would talk to me. It's like, here's something to start doing right now. Everything God encourages us to do, it's for our good. Every time we do it, we are strengthened and we come farther and farther in the spirit to where we grow. And God wants us to grow. When God says forgive, he wants us to forgive right now. When God says bless those that persecute you, he wants you to bless them right now. You go, oh, Lord, I'm not over it yet. He says, yeah, I know. Be spiritual. Step up. Bless them and watch what I do for you. It takes sacrifice. Instead of reading, show love to all people. Give freely to all people. Proclaim the gospel to all people. Feed the poor. Pray for one another. Give thanks in all things. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. Speak the truth in love. Seek peace with all men. Cease from speaking evil. Cease from thinking evil. Cease from doing evil. And every one of those things, just add the word now. It'll change your whole life. Because you will move from being a fan and a spectator to becoming a disciple. And Jesus called us to be disciples. A disciple is one that doesn't just hear the word, they actually do it. Works don't save you, but if you're saved, you better have works. Because works are an evidence you're spiritually alive. When you begin to use what God has given you for the building up of your brothers and sisters, for the building up of the body of Christ, for the building up of the church, for the building up of the kingdom, then you start to realize that walking in the Spirit is not something that is grievous, but it's actually a joy. You find that when you yield to the Spirit for a while and resist the flesh for a while, you actually begin to love what you're doing. You actually begin to walk in the spiritual things and see God moving and go, it's so alive. How did I miss this so long? Yeah. Now see, like she's clapping her hands because she knows. No, because she knows. She's been out there. She's been doing it. And, you know, she's developing, and we all need to develop this way. She has a, she has a gift of word of knowledge, but she didn't know how to use it. She's working on it. And so now she's starting to get these funny, as we're walking past somebody in a mall, she, she hurts in certain areas. She hurts here. She hurts there. She goes, oh, that's weird that I'm hurting. Oh, let's find out. So she's finding that corresponds to people's pains in their body. And then we can say, do you have a problem with your shoulder? Do you have a problem with your leg? And begin to minister to them. She's working on developing that. We need to work on developing our gifts, our word of knowledge, our speaking prophetically to people, our sensing in the spirit, discerning of spirits. We need to work on those things so we can get better and better and better at them so that we can really flow in those things. God wants to flow through us. God doesn't want this Holy Spirit that's within us to come through a straw. He wants it to come through a fire hydrant. Okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Someday exists outside of God's presence, because God's presence is always right now, okay? Hebrews 11, 1 starts with the word, now faith is. It starts with a now. And that word now, I've looked it up, it means I am. That's who God is. He's the right now God. He's the God of today. He's the God of right now. Now, um, I have a little more time. Oh, you know why I have a little more time? Yes, I forgot that. Um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have Pastor Trevor come up for a few minutes, and afterwards, I'm going to be finished with my sermon, but I'm going to ask you to do something. But right now, I forgot to ask Pastor Trevor to come up and give us his, his uh, little talk about India. And so, odd time, but you take a break right now, because afterwards, I'm going to come back, and we're going to do something. We're not just going to listen. We're going to do something. I'll say, Pastor Trevor, could you come up? And I'm sorry to have forgotten Pastor Trevor just got back from India, and uh, we want to hear his good report. God bless you. Go ahead. I uh, want to greet you in Jesus' name. I, uh, the older I get, the less I assume things, and... Uh, and uh, there's one thing I'm discovering as I'm getting older. Health becomes more meaningful. And uh, like Brother Tom said, whatever we've got to do, we've got to do it now. 
like a dear pastor friend. Uh, we were making plans for me to go to United Emirates and uh, Dubai and preach this coming June. And we were planning to go to Kuwait. And uh, this past Thursday morning, this wonderful pastor, he got killed in a car accident. So we've got to do what we're doing now because none of us have any guarantee, really, of tomorrow. And as you know, I just got back from, from India. It's the fourth trip I've made there. Uh, India is the world's largest democracy. And uh, it has a population, it has a population of 1 billion, 335 million, 488, that is of last Friday. Uh, India is 82% Hindu. Hindus have many gods. They have actually 300 million gods. The second largest religion in India is the Islamic religion. That is 16%. Hinduism, 82%. Islam, 16%. Christianity has a total of, of 2%. So the world's largest democracy really, really needs the gospel. Uh, their culture is totally different from ours. I hope you enjoy, at least I do, I hope you enjoy sitting in that pew. Uh, you've got some comfort for your bottom, but you've got something to lean back on to support your back. But in India, they sit on the floor. Now, you just try. I couldn't do it. I mean, cross your legs, sit on the floor, and be in that position for three hours? I would be unable uh, to do that. Something else about India, uh, the men sit on one side, and the women, they sit on the other side. And you don't have to really worry about spending a lot of money on good china. Just buy a few banana leaves, and they become your plates. And you don't have to worry about silverware. You use your fingers. But I will tell you this, when you go to India, one thing you need to take with you. No? Nope. Huh? Yep. When you go to India, the one thing you better take with you is toilet paper. I mean, I even stayed in hotels, but there was no toilet paper. And I would stay in people's homes, and there's no toilet paper. So there's a lot of things in this country we certainly take for granted. Now, uh, I don't know about uh, you ladies, but my wife does not like me walking ahead of her. And she doesn't like me walking through the door and let it swing and maybe hit her. Uh, you know, I'm used with opening the door to let my wife through. But there... The man goes first, and uh, if the door swings, the woman better catch it. Uh, I found, you know, the culture there, and I can't say that's the wrong way to do it because I'm the stranger. I'm the visitor. That's their culture, and I've got to fit in their culture. But I know this, that when my wife and I go to Safeway and there's a couple of bags of groceries to carry out, who, who better carry them? I better carry them. But in India, I don't carry them. That's what a wife is for. You know, and, you know, and I don't want to get political, but all these women demonstrations yesterday, equal rights. Hi. You ought to go to India. You ought to go to India. But people in India, they, they really need the Lord because they are really under a cloud and a spirit of darkness when you have, when you have, Actually, 
of the population that are serving the wrong God and only 2% of the population may be serving the right God? Well, I'll just say this and, 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 and I'll close. Um, I know what it is to feel like a minority. You know, I mean, I don't go out in India in the streets alone because I got white skin and I stand out like a sore thumb, you know. And uh, so two things happened. Uh, One was the person I was with translating for me, we ran out of gas in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you ought to be in the middle of nowhere. And I don't even know where I am. And you're sitting by the side of the road. And we were there for a couple of hours because we were able to phone somebody and just wait for them to bring us some fuel. Another thing, I phoned home because I was a little anxious. But there's that verse in the Bible that says, be anxious for nothing. But uh, I was anxious. (laughs) I mean, me and my translator out, wherever it was, we sat in a motel to make a, a seven-hour journey by car the next day, and we get up, and we walk out, and that car don't start. It doesn't start. And you ain't got AAA. No, you don't. You don't have AAA, and there you are. And uh, you say, help, you know. And I phone up my wife. I say, hi, I, I got a problem. I got, I'm here with a young man. He's not even 30, and we can't get this car going. And she says, well, the Bible says all things work together for good. <laughs> oh, and then she says, don't you believe that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, you ought to be here. Me, 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 be where you are. But something good happened. Hi. Something good happened. There were four police officers staying in that hotel overnight. And now they're leaving in their police vehicle. And they walk out and they see us two guys with the hood open kind of looking at it. That's all I can do. I can just look at it. Because <laughs> I can't. I just look at it, you know. But, you know, those police officers, those police officers, they saw our predicament. And they could have got in their police vehicle and just drove away and left us. But, you know, God used them. And they came over and they worked on that car for about an hour. And they got that thing going. And I said, thank you, Jesus. I mean, I was really happy. You know, I was really, really happy. Amen. Well, when I was there, uh, uh, I uh, took part in a lot of pomp and ceremony. I really did. I was wearing this robe, and I don't know what that hat was they put on my head. But I just felt out of place. You know what I mean? I like a Holy Ghost meeting. I like shouting hallelujah, but this was Pentecostal, but it was really pump. But I was involved in uh, an ordination service where 20 young men were ordained to be pastors and, and, and evangelists. And then I was involved. I was the main speaker. They called me the chief speaker. Ooh, whatever that was, you know. The chief. Yeah. And, and so I was, I was involved in a graduation service where, where 55 uh, Young men had, had worked for four years, and they had gained their doctor's degree. And uh, so I had to address them. And, uh, uh, and these 55 people, they're getting their doctor's degrees after four years. They were from seven different countries and 22 states in India. And there I was. Because <laughs> in 2015, they gave me a an honorary doctor's degree, and they invited me back to be part of these ceremonies. So, I, other than that, I, I spoke in three Bible schools, which I felt comfortable at, and then I spoke in six other churches, saw people filled with the Holy Ghost, and I had the privilege of leading 22 Hindu people to a saving knowledge of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's power in the Word, whether you be in India, Africa, Philippines, or the city of Seattle, and the Holy Ghost is still alive and well today, and He doesn't. He convicts of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. 
and God honored his word, and I made it home safely. Amen. I made it home safely. And I said, to God be the glory, great things here. And listen, I want you to know, you're blessed. You are blessed. And uh, because some people, they maybe earn $75 a month in India and have to survive on that. And I tell you, we are blessed. And instead of complaining about the things we don't have, we should be very grateful and thankful for the things we do have. And the most precious thing I have, I'll tell you what it is, the most precious thing I have and the most precious thing you have is your health. Is your health. And I want to remind you, money, money can buy you a bed, but it can't buy you sleep. Money can buy you medicine, but it can't buy you health. Medicine can buy you a house, but it can't buy you a home. And money can buy you finery, but it'll never buy you beauty. So I thank God for money. I've got to pay my bills, but I thank God for health. And my prayer for you is, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper, be in health, even as your soul prospers. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So, we're glad he's back. We're glad he went because he needed to do it now. While he can, he wants to do those things for God, and we all need to be that way. So, we're going to, in a couple minutes, we're going to pray because when should we start praying? Right. So, my prayer is this. My prayer is this. My prayer is that everybody, everybody here in our fellowship, everybody here would fully mature into everything Christ has called us to be. We, so we need, that's my prayer, it needs to be our prayer that we pray for one another that we will fully mature into everything Christ wants us to be. I pray and we should pray that we all will become real disciples and not spectators. That we will become real soul winners. Soul winners. That we will become good stewards of what God has entrusted to us, everything, including time. That we will become examples of God's love towards people. That we will become skilled users of the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. That God will breathe His life into this body. That this body will stand up and be a mighty army. We've been given power to speak blessings or cursings. Our mouth has very, uh, a lot of power. It says there's power of life and death in the tongue. We need to start speaking blessings over people's lives. And we need to start doing all these things and praying all these things when? Now. Okay. So I'm going to, in a moment, just a very short moment, I'm going to say we're all going to stand up. We're going to go to people. We're going to start praying for them. We're going to start praying God's blessing on their life, God's will on their life, that they would uh, uh, have their spirit right now so energized today that today would be the day we begin a brand new leaf. We start to do now, pray for the other person to spiritually grow, to mature, to flourish. Pray for them to become a soul winner. Pray whatever's on your heart. And if you can't think of anything else to pray for, you pray for this church that as we come together, that people, as they come in the door, they are, they are raised up, that people are grown up, that people are built up, encouraged so that they can go out and do. Now, right before we do that, Elise has given me the signal, which means God has said something to her, shown her something. Come on up, please. I don't know what it is, but we're going to find out because she's exercising her gift, and that's what we should all do. Talk about making someone nervous. <laughs> um, so throughout the service, it hasn't been as intense as I've normally been getting them, but I've been getting this pain that's been coming and going in the left part of my shoulder um, in my neck, and I'm wondering if that is relevant for anyone here. And then I've also been, we'll start with that one. And Anybody? Okay, I'll be sure to pray with you. And, and, then, uh, and then just a little bit ago, I just started getting a sharp pain at the upper part of my right back shoulder, right underneath the shoulder. You too? So it's the same. And it's been moving through? Okay. Well, Jesus is awesome, and you guys are too. <laughs> all right, amen, amen, amen. Way to go. All right, so right now, let's all stand up. And you go, but I don't feel comfortable. Exactly. 
Your flesh doesn't feel comfortable. But it's time. We're going to take five minutes, and I'll call the five minutes. It's five minutes. Let's just pray for people. Pray for each other. Pray that God's will be done in people's lives. Pray that people will grow. Pray that we will together grow as a family. Pray that we will all become disciples and not just talkers. So go for it right now.